All right, Dr. Jonathan Moyer is a research assistant professor at the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies and associate director, director of the Frederick, Frederick S. Party Center for International Futures. Jonathan aids in the strategic planning efforts of various countries, international organizations, and corporations. This funded research has supported analysis for groups like Aero Electronics, New Partnership for African Development, USAID, and the Western Cape Provincial Government of South Africa. He also leads the creation of new data and tools to better understand and analyze international relations theory. This funded research has supported the creation of many new data series, including contributions to documents such as the U.S. National Intelligence Council Global Trends 2030 report. Jonathan also researches the impact of developmental imbalances on the state failure and fragility. He is the lead co-principal investigator on a three-year Minerva-funded research grant that begins in the fall of 2014. Please welcome Dr. Moyer to Mad Scientist. Okay. Hello, 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 hello. Thank you for having me. Thank you for um, the organizers of this event. And I will get right into it because I have a lot to cover. Our business, um, from a research perspective, is long-term forecasting and quantitative analysis. So there should be um, um, some pretty nice synergies between the, us and the focus of, of this conference. So um, I'll, I'll start right away. What we're going to focus on in this presentation is I have two jobs, and I have a relatively short amount of time, so I'm going to be as efficient as I can. Um, the first is to introduce the party center and the tools that we develop. In, in particular, I'm going to focus on one tool called the International Futures System. The reason I'm going to focus on this tool is because, A, it's globally unique. It has some capabilities that uh, no other tool that we're aware of ha has. Uh, two, B, it's free to download and use in open source. So any one of you or people who work with you um, can use a tool like this to explore the long-term uh, global f uh, uh, future. Um, so you can go to the website there, party.du.edu and download the tool, and we're focused on macro-level long-term forecasting for 186 countries in interaction. So I'm going to introduce that tool. That's one of the big objectives I have um, for, for, for this presentation. Um, we, we have a long history. Um, I am not very old. Um, sometimes I feel old, um, or I imagine this is what old feels like. Um, but we have a long history as a center that's doing tool development and analysis. So we've worked with a number of organizations over the past 40 years, um, including, as mentioned in the, in the presentation, um, the NIC for the, for the previous three Global Trends reports, um, and a, a range of other organizations as well. So in this presentation, I'm going to give you a kind of a quick snippet across different issue areas, some, some long-term forecasts that we feel very comfortable in that are going to have a significant impact on the operating environment in 2030 and 2050. I'm going to then, um, while I'm going through different trends, introduce the tool. And then I'm going to focus on um, a research question that we're currently exploring with the Strategic Studies Group in the Army. Um, and Dr. Chris Rice here is a, a fantastic partner of ours, as long, uh, along with other um, groups in the US uh, intelligence community. And then I'm going to leave it open for questions. So the, the question I'm, I'm focusing on is, is global interdependence in decline? And what are some of the implications of declining uh, interdependence, economic, institutional, and normative interdependence between states? So that's the last question. I don't have an easy answer um, to that question, but we're, we're going to kind of outline some of our, our thinking at this point and then show some initial model results. So the tool, International Futures, or IFS, so, uh, some Presenters this morning talked about um, the difficulty of prediction and how sometimes we can do some forecasts. And then there was that lovely um, graphical presentation of you know, predicting what might happen in 2020 and 2025 and 2030. Um, so the business of doing long-term strategic thinking is complicated because the future is fundamentally unknowable. We all know this. Um, we do not, as a, a research center, believe that prediction is something that we should be pursuing. So we try not to predict. What we're interested in doing is understanding systems. We're interested in understanding what the significant uh, causal variables are within systems, how to measure the stocks and flows within a system, and then to think critically about how that system's unfolding. The tool is called IFS, um, very intentionally because we're interested in understanding what are the implications of, uh, of one system changing or one decision being made or one environmental certainty occurring. 
So if, if then is kind of our focus. So I've broken the tool down conceptually into three big blocks. Um, the, the first block um, that I'll focus on, this education, economics, health, demography block, is one that we're interested in, and, and that's focusing on human development, human capabilities development, and thinking about how that's changing across time. We understand how these variables are unfolding pretty, pretty well. Okay? So, so I'm going to go through some, some of these trends. Now, I'm going to describe a number of graphs. A lot of my presentations involve me just describing graphs. So that's what we're going to do for a good chunk of this presentation. Um, so what I have here is different um, groupings of the world broken down by UN, UN regions. The vertical axis here is the, the share of total population that each of those groups represents. Then the horizontal axis is going from 1960 to 2050. So what do we understand really well about the long-term future? Demographic trends are pretty stable across time. I mean, it takes a really long time for birth decisions to impact and eventually for people to psych out, cycle out of the demography system. So we understand these uh, systems quite well. Um, population, obviously, in Asia dominates uh, significantly. But for the long-term operating environment, this, this, this long-term trend in the growth in African population is, is really, really important uh, for people to consider. Um, by 2050, one in four people will be African. This is a really significant um, uh, shift from the 1960s. Also, the long-term decline in European population is another trend that people should just have in the back of their head. These are things that are happening. These aren't things that are highly contingent. This isn't questioning whether you know, cybernetics and robotics will integrate into some weird dystopian war. Like, it's not fringe. This is kind of central, right? Next, something else that's fairly central, global aging. So this is, again, the same UN um, regional breakdowns, but now we're looking uh, at median age of the population, again, from 1960 to 2050. Well, 1950 now to 2050. We're, we have data back further. So some of these timelines do change. So, of course, you can see significant aging in Europe, where average age of the population is increasing by 50% over this time horizon. Again, you see, see countries like Africa, countries, continents like Africa lagging behind here, seeing a, seeing a, a, a more youthful population slightly and then aging, but by 2050, still younger than Europe was in 1950. So these are well understood. People should have these in the back of their minds. Um, life expectancy, improvements in life expectancy. Um, again, we're going back here to the 1950s. Um, and then forward to 2050. And these are, again, looking at UN regions. Significant growth in life expectancy, plateauing in life expectancy. Uh, this is well understood, though this is something that could be disrupted. So this is becoming more contingent. You know? Advances in uh, different kinds of uh, uh, medical technologies, like the one that, has, that caused this blip in African life expectancy growth, which is the ARV, ART transition to uh, treat HIV AIDS. Um, so significantly reducing the, the death burden from uh, uh, HIV AIDS. Um, medical improvements can, of course, change, change these trends, but these are fairly well understood. Yes, sir? A mic? Do you guys have a mic? No mic. I'm good. The question is, is this a linear extrapolation, or how did we come to, to these, these modeling uh, uh, decisions? These all represent, so there's a book written about this. We wrote a book with the World Health Organization that models mortality and morbidity, disability, adjusted life years, quality, adjusted life years, driven by distal and proximate drivers. Um, it's not a simple regression at all. This is, in terms of health modeling outcomes, this is the most advanced, structured, global macro health model that I'm aware of in existence. Um, and that's, that's part of the tool that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to describe. The demography stuff I was showing you, those are results that from a model structure that's very similar to the UN Population Division, except it would, I mean, I have a construction site behind me now, um, except uh, it would have a number of features that the UN population model wouldn't have. And also, it's connected to all of these other systems that I'm going to be showing you. So the tool I'm going to be I'm introducing is one that's deeply, deeply integrated across all of the different kind of development systems I'm talking about. Education years. This education model is, again, um, globally fairly unique. It's, it's a very highly structured model that gets at all the way from primary, lower secondary, upper secondary, tertiary to um, science and engineering, vocational, blah, blah, blah. It's one of the most advanced quantitative models that measures global educational attainment that I'm aware of. Again, this is a trend that's fairly well understood, and people should you know, have this in the back of their, their, their mind as well. The world is becoming more educated. This is average years of education by region. 
GDP per capita. Um, this, again, should be a fairly well understood trend. There is significant growth across regions, though massive disparity exists across regions. Much more disparity exists in GDP per capita than would in, say, life expectancy across regions. That's an important thing, I think, to have internalized. There are also transitions that are occurring in things like GDP per capita. Latin America and population in Asia, for example, are forecast to transition in terms of average per capita income. While we know that average per capita income may be growing, distribution is fundamentally important to understand as well. These, this is a Lorenz curve for GDP globally. What a Lorenz curve measures is it measures the distribution of a resource. So the vertical line here is a line of perfect equality. So 50% of the population would have 50% of the resource. Okay? So if, if the curves down here were up against the, 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 the vertical line there, that would represent a full equal distribution of GDP globally. But we, of course, don't have a fully equal distribution of GDP globally. The, the bottom line, and I know this is hard to read, um, the bottom line represents where we are today, and then it is 2014, 2025, 35, and 45. So what you can see is you can see this significant growth in the global middle class. This growth in the global middle class, I mean, this is the rise of China, this is the rise of the BRICS, this is the rise of the Goldman Next 11. I mean, this is a real thing. People are talking about this. The Global Trends Report, the last Nick report, I mean, this was, a, this was an important part of, of the story, and it's something we should be embracing. The other part of the story that we haven't talked as much about, and I think is fundamentally important, is that if you look at the bottom end of this distribution, the bottom 30% of, of, of the global population is not forecast to significantly change its relative share of global economic output. So there, there are distributional stories here that should be understood to, to better understand the operational environment in 2030 and 2050. So I focus on these human development pieces. I'm going to now touch on these harder harder uh, 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 system pieces. So infrastructure, our infrastructure model is, there's no other model out there that brings together supply and demand across five different types of infrastructure access. Agriculture and energy, other models would exist that would represent agriculture and energy in isolation in really sophisticated ways. If PRI would have one, the World Economic Model of IEA would be, uh, would be another example. The environment, there are lots of other organizations working on doing environmental modeling. The, the reason we're unique and the reason this tool is unique, and one of the, the key points I want to hammer home at the end of the day, is that to understand how the system's unfolding across time, to understand the operational environment in 2030 and 2050, to describe it as the general stated, as opposed to tell everyone what it is, but to explain, to unpack a story related to it, one has to have this entire broad conceptual framework in mind. One has to be able to think nimbly across how energy systems are unfolding, how educational systems are unfolding, how economic and demography systems are unfolding in order to understand this future space. So what are some key trends in this space? Well, we have the rise of, of information sharing which we're all well aware of, but I'm putting it within a, a, a broader context. So the purple line here is mobile phone penetration. The red line is smartphone penetration. The blue line here is fixed line telephones, and the green line is fixed broadband. So we see significant proliferation of the mobile technologies that we're all aware of, but also don't forget the, the broader back-end technologies, that fixed broadband, that long-term trend in fixed broadband growth globally here, that's going to create an, an ICT infrastructure um, that's robust, but also vulnerable. Um, energy production, this is an important trend we should all be fairly familiar with. The red, green, and blue lines represent coal, oil, and gas production globally. Um, the uh, gold line here is nuclear production, and the purple line is hydro. Um, this massive hockey stick curve here is our forecast of general renewable energy production across um, renewable energy types. So this would, John McCain used to have a thing when he was running for president, and he would say, wind, solar, tide, by, out, you know, he ran through a list of different renewable energy types. That's what this is representing. We're not making the case whether it's more bio or more uh, uh, solar or wind, but um, the long-term future of global energy production will see obvious and significant growth in renewable. This is associated with impacts on the environment. So this graph is showing you carbon dioxide parts per million built up in the atmosphere. This is a different graph than the previous ones. This doesn't show regional groupings um, or global grouping. This shows the globe with four different scenarios. So one thing that our tool does is allows users to go in and change assumptions. So if you didn't think that my assumption um, 
related to renewable energy production was sound, you could go into the tool through a user interface, change a variety of, of assumptions or underlying data, and rerun the model and explore all of the interrelated impacts that that changed assumption would have on the world. So what we do here is we create different scenarios that represent different ways in which the world can unfold across time. So these are integrative descriptive scenarios that have internal logical consistency and that represent one potential path. So these scenarios were, were created for the United Nations and they represent a world in which markets are privileged. So what happens if all governments said, you know, let's basically focus on big multinationals and let them make the decisions and run the world. What happens if it's a policy first world? So that's a world in which I like to kind of glibly say that's like if Al Gore ran everything, this would be kind of policy, very kind of top-down directed world. Um, the, the sustainability world is a world in which um, people independently are making decisions to emphasize reduced energy consumption and improved um, sustainable decisions. It's, it's kind of a fairly utopian um, green world. And the security world um, is a world in which security concerns are paramount. Um, that's a world in which the military doesn't maybe do a great job. It's a world in which there are uprisings all over the place, international conflict is, is kind of a mess, and the focus of the, the entire system is on security-related issues. So these here, you get different scenarios related to carbon in the atmosphere. The takeaway, of course, carbon in the atmosphere is building. The other takeaway is that even in the most ambitious environmental scenario, we don't get to 450 parts per million, which is what many people suggest would be um, a, a level of atmospheric carbon buildup that would allow us to avoid most of the, the really, really significant negative externalities associated with climate change. So, climate change is a thing. You all know that. The last big system I'm going to focus on here in the International Futures Tool, and I have about 10 or 15 minutes before um, we'll go to questions, is the, the social system. The way we organize ourselves, the way we organize ourselves domestically, and the way we organize ourselves internationally. Um, the question I'm trying to unpack here is whether global interdependence is on the decline and what may be some of the potential implications of changing interdependence relationships um, uh, across countries. So, this is a really poorly understood space, but we wrote a book on it and we tried to model it. It's not poorly understood in the sense that people don't understand how the worlds govern. It's poorly understood in the sense that doing a, producing a long-term forecast of levels of democracy across time isn't something that many people are invested in because um, there's so much contingency in systems like this. Um, so, one question would be, how do we measure interdependence? You know, what are some ways in which we might be thinking about measuring interdependence? I'm going to focus on this Kantian tripod. So the Kantian, how many people here are familiar with that idea, the Kantian tripod? Okay, so a few people, good. Um, the Kantian tripod is, is Immanuel Kant wrote in essays on perpetual peace, basically that we could create a world in which there was lasting peace if countries in, were invested in three forms of interdependence, economic, institutional, and normative interdependence. So the economic interdependence is normally measured as um, levels of free trade across time, uh, levels of trade across time, capital flows, um, uh, investment across countries. Um, also, Immanuel Kant was really invested in labor mobility as well. We don't have as much labor mobility as we do capital mobility. Um, institutional interdependence has typically been measured through um, shared membership in intergovernmental organizations. That's the, that's the standard way in the academic literature that has been measured. Um, but there are many other ways of thinking about in institutional interdependence happening in the international system. Um, in Kant wrote more about a federation of states, that's what he was invested in. And then normative interdependence has been typically measured as shared level of regime type. So two democracies have some normative interdependence, two autocracies have some normative interdependence, an autocracy and a democracy do not have, the, do not have a clear normative interdependence. Um, you could expand beyond that and say, these are measuring values associated with inclusion of minority groups in governance, um, these, these might be some of the values of interdependence we're interested in. This graph is measuring um, trends in the proliferation of these three kinds of interdependence across time on, on the same, it's a standardized scale, so these are standard deviations around the mean. So, membership in international organizations is up, governance regime type is more democratic, more shared democracies, and of course absolute trade is up as well. We see this at the end of World War II, we build these institutions that create this liberal world order, then at the end of the Cold War there's this massive opportunity to promote this further. All these data play out that these, these nodes of interdependence are growing more dense, and I'm going to 
I'm going to make th this case in other ways as well. This is one way, and no one will be able to see it. This is measuring the dark energy of the universe. No, it's not. <laughs> this is a really cool visualization. It's washed out because of the lighting. Um, but what, it, what this is showing is this is showing a network diagram of the uh, of alignments and interdependences in the, in the Cold War world. So this is 1975. So while it's hard to see, I'm going to walk everyone through it. This is the United States. So bubble size corresponds to material and institutional capabilities. So the US has a very big bubble. The Soviet Union is here. Um, the Soviet space. No. No. no they, I don't know. High video. We need light for the video. So I'll try to describe it. I don't, I, I'm happy to send you these slides, too. But if we go shut our eyes and imagine a world. <laughs> yeah. you know. so, so this is showing foreign policy alignment. And I don't know, it, there's a, a huge network of red here. And this is the Soviet bloc during the Cold War. Then this is the United States. And it brings together this large bloc, which is largely Central and South America, and this large bloc, which is Europe. So this is what the world looks like in 1975. It's not important that you know exactly which bubble is which country. It's important that you get a sense of the density of the network. Okay? This is 1975. This is 1985. The network becomes a little more dense, right? Not massively more dense, but there's a little more density. 75 to 85. The colors change too a little bit. Now let's get into the post-Cold War world. This is using, these are using the same parameters to create this network map that's measuring basically influence, uh, interdependence and affinity across shared countries. This is 1995. It's a much more dense world. This is the United States. This is largely Europe in here. The, Russia is a part of this European block of interdependence. It's become increasingly institutionally and economically interdependent with, uh, with, with Europe. And then the U.S. sits out here with, I believe this is Latin America, Central America. I, I can't see it either. Um, <laughs> and then this is 2005. Using the same parameters and understanding the same measures of density across time, the world has become massively interdependent and interconnected. Okay? This is something we all know. And this interdependence has, I mean, there's a lot of academic literature that would suggest that this interdependence has produced a significantly stable set of relationships in the international system that are internal to the systems of interdependence, produce Pacific relationships across countries. So this is, again, making the case that the world has become increasingly interdependent with Kantian um, values. But there are threats to Kantian interdependence. And these threats, and I'll run through them briefly, these threats to economic interdependence stem from, we have lots of people calling for tighter, tighter border controls and tighter capital controls. I mean, we have one of our uh, presidential candidates calling for a 45% tariff on goods from China. You know, so that was my best impression. It's not very good. Um, <laughs> Um, we have this distributional issue with GDP gains. I mean, you can see in the U.S. on the left and the right, in Europe as well. There are many issues associated with a maldistribution of gains from economic output growth um, since the end of the Cold War in particular. Um, threats to economic interdependence that many people don't think about. A long-term threat is this growth in renewable energy. If every country can domestically produce their own energy supply, um, trade in fossil fuels will decline significantly. Um, this, may this may actually be kind of a, a trend that flies in the face of traditional notions of the importance of Kantian economic interdependence as leading to more Pacific relationships. I don't know if trade in fossil fuels has created significantly more Pacific global relationships or not, but this is likely to decrease global economic interdependence. And then the last bit was, um, this is growth in robotics and artificial intelligence. If Apple has to produce iPods in the United States, it will be done using robots and artificial intelligence it that will largely decouple the cost of production from the cost of labor. So there are threats to economic interdependence. There are threats to institutional interdependence. IOs are ineffective in many, many, many ways. Um, so countries go about engaging in institutional interdependence in different ways. Technology and capital flows have increased the complexity of collective action problems. And IOs are large bureaucracies that are typically slow to respond to these very complicated and fast-moving challenges. IOs have been used to protect influence. So states, the United States included, uses membership in international organizations to protect, project influence, which undermines legitimacy in international organizations. 
China is creating an alternative I.O. framework. Some would argue that this is working within this traditional Kantian Western ideal system in order to, to project influence just like many countries in the West have, but others, you could argue that um, this, this shift, this rupture, this creating of two new poles of interdependence is likely to create a world um, that have competing interest, interest, influence, and increased conflict. Normative interdependence, there's no demonstrated relationship between democratization and growth. Um, premature democratization can be destabilizing, and we've had um, a fairly unsuccessful recent history with democratization uh, efforts, both in the Arab uprising countries and other countries that we've had significant military presences in. So there's significant threat to three of the pillars of Kantian interdependence across time. These threats are occurring in a context in which China is rising based on any objective measure that we have access to. So this is a graph uh, using data from the Global Power Index, which is a measure that was created in the U.S. intelligence community and other, other groups within the U.S. government. And this is measuring the share of global institutional and material capabilities. So this is trying to get at um, the capability to innovate as well as the 70-ton tank that you drive around in. So this shows that the combined capabilities of NATO countries are, have been on the relative decline and will c continue, and then the combined capabilities of China are on the rise. That's one measure. I'm going to show you two other ways to demonstrate this rise of uh, capabilities within uh, China. This is a measure, some new data that we've been messing around with, that's measuring bilateral influence. So what's the influence that one country has on another country? Um, and it's multidimensional. I can get into it if I want, but God knows I'll bore people. This is influence on Pakistan from the United States across time from 1970 to 2013. These data stop in 13. This is the UK. The UK has been on a long, slow decline in a lot of international influence metrics. Um, and then this is, of course, China. So you can see this significant growth in influence. That's the second way um, that I was going to demonstrate the growth in Chinese influence. The third way is by looking at this influence measure again, uh, but looking at it uh, uh, for pie charts in different countries. Again, it's a little washed out. 1990, 2013. Can you even see the red? Can you see the red or is that it doesn't even, not even show up? The red's important on this one. Um, so China, India, Russia, South Africa, uh, the little pie slices that are red here compared with the little pie slices that are red up here. Um, this shows, and I think this is actually a pretty impressive um, graph if the colors worked out well. Um, this shows significant growth in Chinese influence across many, many, many countries. This isn't just a one-off kind of situation. So interdependence is important. It's under threat. Uh, and China it, this is all happening within a context where the Chinese system is rising and, and, and will be significant. The last bit of this puzzle, so I'm trying to describe a future international system. There was a slide for the movie that we watched that, that, that said that a rising multipolar system will constrain hegemony, basically. This is a graph that's showing a measure of the number of great powers in the international system based on a certain threshold, and the number of middle powers from 1960 to 2050. I don't think this is a trend that's talked about by very many people. But the number of great powers is likely to go from two to one. That's where we are now, more or less. We're moving out of that into a period where there are two, quote unquote, great powers, and then eventually into one where there are likely to be three. And that would be India would be the third um, in the long term future. But the decline in middle powers is the interesting trend here. So we're going, we're going from a system where at the turn of the, the, the 2000s, you saw about 10 middle powers to one where you're likely to see three or four. This is significant because the global high table, the global decision table for state-based decision making is going to only get higher and more exclusive. The gap between the high table and everyone else is likely to grow. That's going to change how decisions are made. That's going to change the operational environment in some significant ways. So I think that's also an important trend that's taking place that should help further describe what this operational environment is likely to look like. This isn't me saying I have a, any answer or prescription to any of these. This is me describing the results of a large long-term modeling uh, exercise or series of exercises. So what are the implications of this? 
This, these are some initial results from early modeling that we were doing that's looking at bilateral threat of conflict across time. And this is work that we're doing with the Strategic Studies Group um, with Dr. Chris Rice, who I think is speaking next. But this is work that has been done before. This was work that was done prior to our engagement with Chris. Um, and this is measuring the probability of conflict between China and the U.S using four different scenarios. And these are the same four scenarios that I use for the environmental um, carbon buildup uh, forecast. And these four scenarios show that under most cases, the threat rises and falls. And these cases, the threat rises and falls because there's a power transition. And levels of interconnection aren't significantly impacted. If we focus on markets, policy, or sustainability, they're all kind of in the same space. But if the world significantly declines, decreases its interconnection, decreases its innovation, um, and decreases the three pillars of the Kantian tripod, it's likely, based on historical precedent, we all know there are problems with that assumption, but it's likely that this world will, will, will lead to one in which there's a, a much higher long-term probability of interstate conflict. And I'm not suggesting anything about the nature of that conflict. I'm talking about the general character of the relationship um, between between these states. So that's our initial work. Again, this is the, the framework that you're, we're using to explore these issues. Again, the tool is free. Um, it's the only tool that, in, in my experience, connects energy and governance and infrastructure and health. And you can ask questions about changing investments in roads and how that impacts uh, another country's economic potential or ability to invest in female education or uh, their, their level of governance and inclusion. So with that, I think that's the end. So questions? Yes, sir. Dr. Moore, uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, Scott Peak, uh, Arctic, and I want to thank you first you for Arctic? Army Capabilities Integration Center. Okay, I have no Army military background, so I know none of these acronyms. Roger, That's and uh, <laughs> first off, I want to thank you for a very illuminating uh, presentation. And models like IFS and other predictive analysis really help us to understand what the future might look like, help us describe potential realities. I'm curious, how close are we? at being able to optimize the variables and then try to interpret how we might achieve a desirable outcome. Are we even close to that with models like this? And if, I was wondering if you could comment on that. Thank you. Um, so IFS isn't an optimization model in the sense that some models are designed to optimize a particular kind of outcome. You could re-engineer this pretty easily to optimize things. Um, but I don't know if that's the right approach to thinking about especially long-term modeling. I think that long-term modeling has to rest on conceptual understandings of the system that you're, you're exploring. So we think the most important thing that we can do is help people think carefully about how they're thinking about the world. We're not interested in saying, invest 2% here, 4% there, 3% there, and then you go home and go to sleep, you're fine. You know what I mean? We're interested in saying, oh, if you're interested in cyber, we just wrote a big report on cyber, you have to think about cyber in these ways. If you're interested in the long-term um, conditions and context for understanding cyber and cyber threats. So we don't do optimization as much, and for me, that's more of kind of an inductive approach to doing these uh, modeling exercises where we're much more interested in saying, you know, okay, so how, what is power in the international system? How can it be operationalized? How does this relate to how we've understood it to be expressed in the past? And how do we understand these systems to unfold moving forward? So we try to take a much more structured approach to this, which is not data mining. It's not inductive analysis for the most part. Um, everything's got a little inductive in it. Um, but for the, yeah, I, hopefully that answers that question. Yeah, is there another microphone? Yes, sir. Great, great presentation on interesting work. And I'm, I'm Kevin Mangum. I'm General Perkins' deputy, his vice principal, as he calls me. Um, <laughs> what, your last slide uh, raised a, another question. So the probability of conflict, from a broad, in a broader perspective, can you use this model to gauge probability of competition, vice conflict? Yeah. Uh, you know, so conflict. Conf 
uh, short of conflict, but rising competition and potential friction? So we're starting, uh, that's a great question, because I'm really interested in that too. This model was calibrated, I believe, in, it's going to sound horrible, the late 90s. I think that was the last time this was really calibrated, this particular version of this variable. The whole system we're updating constantly, but this particular variable is part of the reason we're really interested in working with Dr. Rice um, to unpack this. But we're at the point of starting to forecast a number of bilateral measures, so bilateral trade, bilateral IGO embed embeddedness, bilateral uh, embassies, bilateral treaty embeddedness, to try to get at some of those questions related to competition as opposed to conflict. And just to clarify this, this isn't calibrating a tool to conflict as in a major episode of political violence, like a thousand dead or more. This is just, these are militarized interstate disputes. So this would be a much lower threshold of a conflictual relationship. But we're hoping to get to better understandings of competitive relations because we agree that that's, that's more likely to characterize the next set of relations. Yes. Fascinating presentation. However, one potential weakness. Historical analysis shows that every era of enhanced international interdependence, particularly in trade, is followed by a subsequent era of enhanced conflict, either outright war or state versus state retaliation. Mm -hmm. Some historians and some economists say that enhanced international trade eras actually aggravate mm -hmm. the weaknesses of the international system. Mm -hmm. How do you reconcile that historical precedent with your model? The, so this would not just be trade interdependence. That would be my first response. But the trade interdependence question is really fascinating, and it's one that's interested me for, for a while. I mean, the example... I look to is World War I, and I don't know that causally trade, if I were to really unpack a causal understanding of World War I, I, trade wouldn't be one of the first things that I would point to as a driver of that. But to the broader point of trade being a potentially destabilizing force in the international system, conceptually it just doesn't resonate with my <clears throat> understanding of the world. Um, connections between groups of people who have different comparative advantages and can manufacture in one place and benefit from the manufacture of something else in some other place makes a con this is how we try to think about the world makes conceptual sense to me and i've seen evidence that that makes sense in in the the real world as well so that's the only maybe really unsatisfying response I can give. I think the broader point you're making is really an important one, which is that historical precedent really has to be unpacked and understood. And you can have, let me give you an example. So we're doing work on this Minerva initiative that's better understanding state failure. So when do states fail? There was this great uh, article that was public by, published by Goldstone and a bunch of other academics in the American Journal of Political Science. It's a really groundbreaking article that introduced a model that predicted state failure with 85% accuracy and out of sample testing. When we retest that in the more recent period, their, their out of sample period was the 90s and the early 2000s. When we retest that in the most recent period, that predictive accuracy goes down to about 30%. So what you see there is significant temporal variation in the historical drivers of something like state failure. This ex these exist for all of these systems and further unpacking the relationships. I'm, I guarantee there are, are examples that anyone could point to of trade being an accelerant of conflict. But m the way I understand the world and the way I've looked at the numbers, I think there are many, many more examples of trade being used as a tool for creating interconnections, which change the calculus of how states engage in the international system. It changes the cost of decision making. That's the conceptual argument that I would go back to. Yes, sir. Yes. Or whoever. So dovetailing in the gentleman's question is this idea. I, it's, it's striking to me the linearity of your, of your graphs, whether you know, we understand demographics, we understand all the rest, but there is a great deal of linearity. And so that strikes me a bit unrealistic, as if we, we can't, um, there's an underlying assumption here, right? So that things run smoothly, but I posit that and a lot of the things that you, you have demonstrated here, there is a strain due to a number of issues, primarily economics. If you look at the inequality, 
you can talk about trade all you want, you can talk about all the issues you want, but there is a strain ongoing, particularly in this country, but across the world, about the effect of inequality across the board. And that could lead to very much singularity events. Uh, you know, a lot of, you know, wars are, are, are started because of these inequalities and in economic conditions and so forth. You know, water shortages, energy shortages, all kinds of things. So, in looking at your modeling, is there a possibility to insert singularity events and their impact based on these kinds of trends? Again, going back to this issue of the history of, of, of events leading to opposite effects as we un understood them at the time. Yeah. So, I mean, there are a lot of variables that have more linear trends in the forecast than in the history. Um, that's, that's an artifact of we're aggregating and we're abstracting a bit more than reality. I mean, we're trying to model a, a real complicated space. In terms of adding disruptive events, um, in the future, the tool's designed to be able to do that. You could go in and add a, a conflict between countries and then explore some of the implications of that. I don't find that particularly as useful as I do trying to think from a conceptual structural perspective about how the international system's unfolding, about how development works and about how governance works. That's, that's my, my preference. But the tool's designed, if you wanted to go in and explore the implication of, we're starting a project now uh, exploring artificial intelligence. Um, what if there is, you said singularity, what if singularity was a thing that, boom, happened? What kinds of, what would the implications be? For me, I would prefer to understand a conceptual framework for, for thinking about, well, what does that mean and how might that impact different things and then explore it quantitatively. But the tool's designed to allow for scenarios to be created as well, yeah. I don't know who has the microphone. Yes, in the back. You blend it in. You're in camouflage, and there's all this camo I can't see. can't see half. Is there five people in the room? I can't tell. Good morning. We have a question from the virtual audience. It said, how about changes in the number of athletes, participants in the Olympics in comparison to changes in populations? Is there a linkage between the status and power of a country based upon the number of participants in the Olympics? So some, I mean, people, are, people talk about that as a, as a measure of soft power. Um, and so when we've, and in another project, a very, very small project, we tried to create a measure of soft power just for one year that, that did things like that. Measured Olympic uh, w m medal winners, it measured Nobel Prize winners, it measured Twitter followers, like who has the most Twitter? You know, Katy Perry has a ton of Twitter followers. She's, yes, yeah, I got a <laughs> you, uh, you know, just stuff like that. So we've messed around with some of these things, but we don't incorporate any forecast of soft power in the system at this point. Someone else have the mic or? Last question. Okay. Thank you. That was last. Oh, that was last? Okay. So oh, here we go. Are we ready for the science experiment? Okay. So, uh, Jonathan, we have, um, first off, Tom Greco, the G2 TRADOC. In TRADOC, Training and Doctrine Command. Thank you. We, we recruit the Army, we train the Army, we design the Army, and then we build the Army. Sounds like you guys are pretty important. Well, <laughs> so, so in our job in the TRADOC G2 and why we have mad scientists is to help us to understand and then help to describe what the future looks like. So your work is extremely important to us. We, during the Chief of Staff's Future War Game Unified Quest, we looked at 2030 and we looked at 2050. And what we found was there are very few facts about 2030 and there are even less mm -hmm. about 2050. Mm -hmm. But what you've given us is a solid framework and a great start point for us to start thinking about the future. And it's important for us to think clearly about the future. So within the Army, we have what's called challenge coins. Okay. okay? And, <laughs> and our challenge coin has the TRADOC on one side and the Mad Scientist logo on the other. And with this comes a charge that you have it on you, and if another member of the mad scientist community challenges you, say, for example, at a bar, you have to buy them a drink. Oh. So when you're around Army guys, it's good to have this with you. Thank you very Thank much. You, hey. Thank you very much. And <laughs> if you come over here. Now, traditionally, our, going, our, our thank you gift has been a a picture, a poster of the Mad Scientist Conference so that you can hang it on your wall. 
But what we found was we framed those, and people who will travel only with carry-ons uh, uh, couldn't take it. So we've come up with two new things. So first off, Al, if we could, are you going to read the scroll? Or I'll read the scroll, OK. Just like we rehearsed it. OK. <laughs> <clears throat> So, proclamation, United States Army Training and Doctrine Command, mad scientists. Whereas, the mad scientist initiative encourages continuous dialogue and collaboration among academia, industry, government, and non-traditional partners. And whereas, the mad scientist initiative identifies tomorrow's key innovations today so that the U.S. Army is successful in the future operational environment. And whereas, the mad scientist initiative supports Army learning and capability development, and whereas Mr. Jonathan Moyer has provided great and valuable insights and contributions to furthering the mission, goals, and understanding of the Mad Scientist Initiative, and therefore, <laughs> by virtue of the authority vested in me as the Grand Wizard of the Deputy <laughs> Chief of Staff of Intelligence, I here do proclaim that Mr. Jonathan Moyer be known henceforth and forevermore as an official mad scientist with all the rights, privileges pertaining thereto. May you also seek, may you also seek the future boldly, actively question conventional wisdom and assumptions, and passionately challenge the status quo. And that's not all. So. Wow, with, I didn't realize this. Oh. So, yeah. so, that is hot. Yes, would you hold this? So, and Dave, I'm, if I spill a little water, you'll have to forgive me. So, as you can see, this is a magic, this is a magic coffee mug. The wizard's doing his wizard. <laughs> and as you see, it'll slowly you have to, yeah. turn white. Or maybe not. Yeah, it's good then. Yeah, it is. There we go. Yeah, it takes a couple. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it very much. Thanks.